warm welcome, please, for a great contributor to the Open Group, Judith Jones. Thank you. Thank welcome, you. Judith. You're welcome. Thank you, Steve. I didn't realise I was quite so ancient. That's uh, <laughs> so let me see if I can work this now. So I have a new gadget for me. So welcome and hello. And I'm hoping I'm going to put a little bit of fun into life today. Um, so I'm going to talk about Back to the Future. Now, uh, I don't know if any of you came over on the British Airways flights, but if you went through all the films, you'll have seen the Back to the Future um, uh, film. And uh, that was really, it's one of my favourite films of all times, that series. So um, I thought it was most appropriate um, that we should talk about where enterprise architecture is going, where the digital world is going, etc. Now, you might think I'm going to talk technical. Well, I will a little bit, um, but I'm not. What I'm going to talk about is the fourth industrial revolution and what that means to us in terms of the enterprise architecture world. Some people call it the next production revolution. And the question is often asked, so what's that got to do with enterprise architecture? That, you know, wh where does it fit? And of course, quite a lot, right? Actually, enterprise architecture will enable that fourth um, industrial revolution to be successful or not quite so successful. And that really is the whole point of my discussion today is to work with you to try to work out how we can make it more successful. And I heard the messages that we had today. And um, so what's it got to do with enterprise architecture? Well, I'm going to introduce you to Marty. And if you've seen the film, you know who Marty is. Um, I'm going to talk about Marty and what Marty thinks um, about it and what's important to Marty. And one of Marty's dreams, of course, is to have a fantastic journey and to be able to go to the future as he would wish to go to the future. Right? Um, so those are my two main components of my talk today, Marty and Back to the Future. And those of you who have seen the film will go, what about the mad professor? Where's he? Where's he on that map? Well, hey, guys. That's you, right? You're the mad professors, okay? You're the guys driving the digital transformation. You're the guys taking us into the future. You're the guys with your fingers on that button. And I want to talk to you today about the things that I think we expect you to be able to do. And no, Bob, that picture wasn't chosen for you, okay? He sat down, he missed that point. So um, what uh, are, is it about enterprise architecture? Well, let me take you into another world, one that you probably very rarely go. You might see a bit of news, etc., in the newspapers or on Beeb TV or um, somewhere else, CNN or wherever it is that you look. I'm going to talk to you about the World Economic Forum, some of the work that they've done. And I did talk um, a few years ago about World Economic Forum, and I'm, I've been following them for quite a long time. They've been doing a lot of work in the digital space. So basically, they are the leaders of the thinking area around the fourth industrial revolution. And what they think that is, is what we call the rapid, simultaneous, and systematic transformation. Um, driven by advances in science and technology. I'm not just going to talk about IT. I'm going to talk about science and technology. I'm going to talk about the whole picture, which is what we need to think through, and how it's reshaping our geographic boundaries. It's blurring boundaries. It's, it's merging industries. Um, it's challenging our existing regulatory framework. And it's even redefining what it means to be human. Wow, 
Now, is that transformation or not, right? So they set up a centre called the Fourth Industrial Revolution. They publish lots of papers and stuff. I would well recommend people to go and have a look at it. You know, I, I look at it every month, right? not every day, I'm not, but I look at it every month to see what new papers have come out, etc. And one of the things that they have done is they're looking at um, how they can develop new policies. Um, they're working with governments, um, major government leaders, also working with major consultancies and organisations. They bring the big guys right into their world and the little guys. So we're a little guy, so we're a little guy in their world. But nevertheless, what they are doing is trying to bring together that bigger space of what's going on. So I would well recommend you to look at it. And there's lots that's going on in that space. Now, as well as the World Economic Forum, of which many of the world leaders go to, there's also the G7. Uh, it used to be, I think it was G8 when I last talked about it. Um, but it's now G7. And uh, they have a major thrust on digital transformation, for those guys who don't realise that. Um, they are talking about it being the rationale for major change across their industries and their economy. So they are taking notice of the things that we are doing. Um, and they also are the third world countries who are catching up very fast, leapfrogging in the digital transformation world. So what G7 calls it is the next production revolution. And digitisation is dominating their conversations for all sorts of reasons. Now, we're recognising that the world economy is becoming even more digital. We've just heard some stories this morning. That's, that's just a little bit of what is going on. Um, there is a huge use of digital technologies in all sorts of different industries. And it's profoundly changing the way in which we're doing our business, the way in which people live, the way they're ev evolving. Artificial intelligence is one of the major uh, focuses of their digitisation thinking. Because, of course, they're very worried about what it will do to the people and the jobs that are in their community. Who's going to win? Who's going to lose? Are the poor going to get poorer and the rich get richer? These are things that we have to think through. Now, one of the things they're looking at is how we're going to change our businesses and our industries as a result of that. And there's a few things that they're doing, which I'm going to be bringing out later on. But then there is also the G20. Now, the G20 are a group of 20 countries, which includes the G7 and the G8. And the G20 represents 85% of the global economic growth. They also represent 75% of international trade. And Singapore, which is where we are now, um, has been a, a, like a, 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 an adopted member, if you like, into the G20 environment um, up until 2018. I don't know where they're going next, so I'm not the person to ask, but it might be worth asking um, in your own community. And the G20, obviously, are also following the digital transformations that's going on. They have three focuses. Their focus is the future of work, infrastructure for development, and the sustainable food future. Obviously, the first is all about making sure that people are able to exploit and use this new digital revolution. So we don't get too many small, big winners. Not everybody wins. And then the infrastructure, how they can develop their national infrastructure to support these changes. And then, of course, the big thing that they have is how they're going to feed their people. And they look to new technologies to do that. You've only got to look at a country like Nigeria, where we do a lot of work. And in Nigeria, there's only about, um, I'd say about 70 million people in the city. And they're the ones with access to 
technology and digital capabilities. There's over 100 million more people out in the country who haven't got the capabilities to do that, but they will have. In the next five to 10 years, solar power, all sorts of capabilities will be moving into those regions to enable those villages and small towns to participate in the revolution. And their banking community knows that. And so what you find is that they are gearing themselves up to manage digital transformation in a major way. But it's not digital transformation of existing IT, it's for nothing. And they will make leapfrogs into that big world. So these are the types of backgrounds that are going on. These are driving us. These are driving the customers who are driving us. And we therefore need to understand what this is all about. So in uh, August of this year, there was a conference um, with the digital economy uh, in G20. And there were some ministerial declarations. I don't know if anybody heard about them. Hands up, anyone that's seen this? Good, because I'm going to tell you what it's about. So they had this um, digital agenda for developing digital economies. Um, they see a digital economy as being something which relies on quality, affordability, very important, secure, accessible, very important, and inclusive digital infrastructure. They see it as an environment that's going to support innovation, that's going to create an environment for new policies and new frameworks and new regulatory capabilities, and they're gearing themselves up for that. They see it as the ability and the capacity for businesses to adapt to digital transformation, the little businesses that are out there, and the big businesses. And they see it as a free flow of information and ideas and knowledge. And also, they're looking at how they can build consumer trust, consumer privacy, data protection, and IPR um, into this whole new world. So they're looking, governments are looking very seriously at this. And there are some aspects of that that I'll um, touch upon that we're doing in the UK. So one of the things they did is they came out with four statements. One is about digital principles. The second is bridging the digital gender gap. Right? Um, and the third was measuring the digital economy. I was very interested in what Trevor was saying about measurements because governments want to know how they measure digital economy and the success of digital transformation. Nobody knows yet. Right? only in the first ideas that are going forward. And then they want to accelerate their digital infrastructure for their development of their countries and their economies. So this is absolutely fundamental. Huge things going on in Africa, huge things going on in India, huge things going on in South America, you know, to change and radically improve their infrastructure so they can join in. So that's the background of what the G20 came up with. And some of those questions that they started to address, of course, to me, I asked the question, what does that mean to enterprise architecture? What do we have to do in enterprise architecture to help that happen? What's our job? So they are very keen on developing the digital economies. These are the things that are really going to drive that digital transformation. Um, so they want to see if we can develop um, high-quality data infrastructure. This is quite critical for them. They want to understand how to use and measure digital technologies. How, as a result of that, the Internet of Things can help them create capabilities in their country for their citizens to take advantage of. They also want active participation uh, in how to develop and improve international measurement standards. Well, you know, guys, you're starting to come into a bit of our space. And they want to work collaboratively to bridge existing measurement gaps in key dimensions. So they want to understand the economic value in the digital economy. They want to understand how to measure these data flows 
And this data that's flowing in and out of their country, what does that mean? Now, we do have some countries already that go, you are not moving financial data out of my country. So we're already getting limitations, and we will get a lot more limitations that we have to learn how to deal with. Um, the interface between trade and the digital economy, how is that going to work? They don't want to lose out, and they don't want their people to lose out, but they're very keen on understanding how that's going to happen. And to build the capacity that they need to collect and disseminate the data that is going to be used within their environment. So they're looking at more diverse sources of data and tools. And one of the things that's come out of this thinking is something called open data. And if anyone's explored open data, it's a real major initiative, open data. Every country has got open data. What they are doing is opening up their data, right? opening it up, sharing it between countries with businesses. They are looking at businesses to do the same. What they want to do is to create a global open data world so people can move their data around freely and understand what's going on. Because data used in the right hands is real power and knowledge. So that's their key. That's what they're looking to do in their digital economy. And they came out with seven principles. So immediately I latched onto that and I'm like, OK, principles, that's an EA thing. So um, I'm going to have a look at what these principles are all about. <coughs> Excuse me. So, <coughs> so they have seven. One is on services. Um, so what they want to do is to develop digital governance. So they want to look at what the services are that are going to meet their needs. They're going to look at, they have a principle about data. They want to know how they can get an open and data-driven environment and culture in their public domain. And then they're looking at evolution, establishing um, a framework to commission digital technologies, but also to accommodate them in the fast-paced change that we're doing. So they recognize it's all moving too fast. It's moving faster than I think any of our individuals can understand. And we've been in this game a long time. So what chance do they have? So they know it's moving very quickly. They're looking at security principles. How will they protect themselves against the hackers and the sec cyber securities and the criminals? And how can they make sure that their country is safe? So how can they promote that trust and security capability? They're looking for that. And they're looking at us to give them some of the answers. And then they're looking at the digital skills. Many of these countries don't have those digital skills. They need retraining. They need to understand it. Out in the villages and the towns, they need to understand it. We need a huge wave of digital education that people can understand what it means to them in their world. And then we need standards. Of course we need standards. Wow, you're just straight in the open group area, guys. They're looking at us saying, what are the standards that we can have? Help us understand what the digital standards are that we need in our industry. And then we have the strategies. How are they going to prioritize and facilitate their funding and the implementation of digital government strategies? So those are seven principal areas, and there's stuff behind them. So you need to be thinking about, what are they doing with these principles? Well, they're looking to try and change the culture in their environment and in the way they trade with each other. And remember, their 85% the economic value, 75% of trade goes through these countries. So they're looking for the standards, and the other countries are going to be going with them and following them, because they'll be catching up using the G20 thinking. So much of the digital transformation of industries is going on and happening, and it is now on the government radar. Okay. Um, now, we know that transformation has transformed many industries. Social media platforms radically changed the way people communicate with each other. E-commerce 
in the UK, I don't know if you've heard, but you know, e-commerce is taking over our high street. Our high street is starting to look deserted as the, as the people are leaving because they can't compete in that world. Digital cars. Everybody's now talking about a digital car. Even my son is now saying, Mom, I think my next car will be a digital car. Okay, Then I don't have to keep doing the driving. Um, building technology, completely transforming the way we do the construction industry. All the R&D stuff that's been going into health and med Medicare and, the, and those areas, that, that is radically changing the way people think about their health. Right? We've all got nanotechnology inside us, monitoring all our different you know, problems. And I don't know about you, but there's a lot of people in this room looking like me, you know, ancient, getting ancient now, right? We need that. Um, and then the logistics companies totally revolutionized it. When people talk to me about digital transformation, I say, oh, go and look at the logistics industry. If you really want to know what it's about, it's not about the IT and the digital. It's about how they've applied it in their business. It's the business that has changed. If you look at Uber, what has Uber done? Well, I can tell you Uber has only done IT as people understand IT today. What they did is to change the space. Instead of having employees, they've got drivers who are self-employees. Instead of customers ringing a telephone number up, they now press a button and do it on their iPhone. And they do a deal. They've not changed the IT underneath it. They're still using standard, probably got a Unix box underneath there somewhere, right? Um, but what have they done? They've changed their enterprise space, the way they think about it, changed their organization structures, changed their thinking, their principles. They've thrown away the old ideas about building an enterprise and all looking inside, right? They look outside. I don't build my capability here, I go out. I look, is that capability out there that I can use and leverage on? I don't need to build my big capability in here anymore. Okay. Um, and so it goes on. Banking services, finance services, bin apps, revolutionizing it. You go into um, UK now, used to be able to walk along the high street and see five branches of banks. Now you'd be lucky to see one. Branches are closing down at a rate of knots. 3,000 or so of them already gone, right? Another 3,000 are going to go. They don't need them anymore. People are all doing fin apps. And do you know what? They're doing it on the phone. So they don't even need all those computers anymore, right? It's completely revolutionized the way in which the banking industry is operating. And of course, that will be the same everywhere. And I'll tell you my story about Nigeria, right? In Nigeria, when I first went there, I asked the question, I had somebody on one of my training courses, and I asked her the question, how many mobiles have you got in Nigeria? Oh, we've got 10 million, she said. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and we're doing a lot of business over the mobiles, because of course we don't have the land infrastructure. We don't have the pipes and the cables and the whatever. It's all on the mobile infrastructure. It's all up there. Next year I went, and uh, I asked the question, how many mobiles are there? Thinking there might be about 50 million. Oh, there's 30 million. What? And every year I went back and asked that question. The last time I was there, about 18 months or so, or so ago, and asked the question, and there were well over 110 million mobiles and they are all doing their banking on their mobiles, right? They are all doing their insurance on their mobiles. They are all doing their retail on their mobiles. Anyone thinks that Nigeria is a backward company, rethink it is a digital economy. It is a digital transformed country. And that is happening everywhere, all over. Because, of course, we're saddled in the old countries with all the landlines and the telecoms companies and everything, but they're not. They could put a little satellite dish on a village, and then all the people in the village can have their mobiles. Right? They could put a little solar panel next to it, and they've all got their mobiles. Now, 
the other little side of the story is that their infrastructure is not very good in other areas. Um, so one day, and I was talking to somebody there, and I asked them uh, what, what I was talking about, something to do with uh, an enterprise architecture. And, and the next thing, her phone rang in her back. So she got the phone out, started talking. Um, and I, and I, then the, another phone rang, got the phone out. There's another phone. And then, I, I, and then another phone rang. She got another phone out. I said, how many phones have you got? She's got three. One for business, one for family, and one if the other two break. <laughs> Why do they break? Because the electricity supply services aren't very good. Okay. So at any one time, their telecoms line might be down. So they've got, got three. I said, that explains 110 million mobiles then, right? Um, the answer was probably, right? But I, not everybody's got three. They've mostly got two. Okay, fine. Now I understand. Now I understood what was going on better. But you see, that is a pretty classic thing that's happening in those industries. You know, electricity supply industry is poor. The road transport in is poor. Those things are poor. But the digital is not poor, really, apart from the electricity supply. Then there are lots of governments in smart cities. Um, I know uh, smart cities don't appear to have uh, moved very far um, or since I first started looking at them 10, 20 years ago, but they have. Um, if you look at the water industry, and I always put this picture up, people are very interested in that. They have a very special message on it. In the, um, the water industry, we measure everything now from every little interface, everything that we need to measure, every KPI of water quality is measured. We know when there's been pollution in a particular parts of our water supply, and we know why. We know what the speed of the water transmission is. We understand how our water supplies run. And this isn't unique anymore. This technology can be available to everybody. There's one thing about the water industry that I have to make a point about. Water in knows no boundaries. It knows no geographic boundaries. It flows from one country to another country to another country. People have dammed up the water and wars break out. Water is absolutely vital for our economies today. And how do we manage that? No one country can manage their water. No one country. Even in the UK, we're an island, so we don't have all that interconnection. But do you know what we have around our island? Water. And what's in our water? Pollution. And what comes up on our beaches? Pollution. And what's poisoning our fish? Pollution. And what's poisoning our people? Pollution. Because all those microbeads have got into the ocean and into the fish, and we eat fish, and they're getting into us. Pollution. Pollution of the seas is massive. Now, we have the capability to be able to manage that. We've got to clean it up. We can't leave our future generations with the mess. So, digital transformation also starts with cleaning up the mess. We've got to think about the infrastructure in that way. We have to think about our world. And when we look at digital transformation, we have to think about the Earth. We can't just gaily go off and do a bit of transformation and say, oh, well, we've done that, that's good. You've got to think, what's your cleaning up mechanism? What mess are you leaving behind? How are you going to fix that? That's what we need to think about. And water is the key to that. Now, we've shown in the UK that we can measure all our water quality. We can improve our water quality. That has to be done for everybody in the world. We can't just keep it with the rich nations. You have to share that with everybody else. So, one of the key things that Theresa May, bless her cotton socks, has done, she talked to the Davos, the people in World Economic Forum, about regulation of technology companies. And one of the key things she said that really, really resonates is this. 
When technology platforms work across geographical boundaries, no one country, no one government can deliver the international norms, rules and standards for the global digital world. We need to take that on board. The status quo is increasingly unsustainable. She said this, this year, in February. It becomes clear that these platforms are no longer just passive hosts. So there are lots of new ventures going on. Uh, in particular, World Economic Forum have got a venture um, to bring together all the internet giants and multi-stakeholder leaders and all sorts of people to try to address this. So we've got global infrastructure, but they're going to govern us. They're the legal framework. Now, that's the background of the world that we're in. That's what digital transformation is doing. And what we're doing is we're pumping out digital platforms. And do you know what? Some of these are super, absolutely super. But we need to understand what the impact of those platforms are. Internet of Things. What happens if half of them just disappear into the water supplies? Right? You've got to think about the cleanup. What about blockchain? Blockchain isn't just for the finance community, if anyone thinks it is. You know, they know, there's a paper on it from uh, World Economic Forum. They're now using blockchain technology to address illegal fishing around the world. All sorts of stuff that's going on. You know, IBM got Watson. I mean, that can go so fast, right? It beats Concord. Um, and then we've got social media that's bringing communities together. Everybody's been able to talk to each other across the boundaries. And there's a whole list of other things that are in there. And you all know these. You know why? Because, hey, guy, you're my mad professors out there, right, in the forums. You're the guys that are helping us create these things. But there are other forums as well, biotechnology forums. In the energy and water industry, they're doing things. Medicine and healthcare, doing things. You know, they're using digital transformation capability to improve their industry. So there's a lot going on. And what does enterprise architecture do? Well, it brings it all together, right? Enterprise architecture transformation is now got to get going. What we've got now is mostly addressing our legacy world. Okay, we've got to change that. We've got to transform it. Because what we do today will determine our tomorrow. And I would like to think that I leave the world at least as clean a place as I came into it um, as I left it. I don't think I will. But I hope that that was what I could try to achieve. So that's where I'm coming from. Now, one of the things that hits you out of the G7, the G8, and the G20, and the World Economic Forum, and all these things, is, is the emergence of the digital citizen, right? the emphasis of the rights of the citizen in digital economies. So I have a number of areas that we've looked at, you know, consumer protection, obviously, GDPR in Europe, it's going to happen everywhere else in some form, shape, product protection, transparency and trust, multiple stakeholders working together, human rights, Semantic interoperability, how we talk with each other, how we express things, how we trade, how we work with each other. And there is going to be increasing open access to capabilities. And what that's going to do is mean that the citizen is going to demand more of the organisation. Already, if you're an Uber taxi driver, you're a citizen. You're not an employee of Uber. You're a citizen in your own right. You have rights. Increasingly, that's what the governments are legislating for. Now, the challenges for enterprise architecture is that we've got open data, we've got digital evolution, we've got digital services, digital skills. We've got to set the standards and the strategy. We've got to make sure that we're secure. How does it impact us in the A. Well, what it's going to do is it's going to create an explosion of domains. So many different domains of architecture. Okay. 
So we've got citizen architecture, we've got digital architecture, AI architecture, is that the same? I'm not sure if it is. We have portable applications, FinApps has, has proven that. Open data, cybersecurity, all sorts of different domains that are coming uh, that we need to address. And then our organizations are all being redesigned. Deloitte's done an awful lot of work in this space. They said, this is how things were up at the top. And this is how things are now, all interconnected. And this is how things work, all interconnected, all interconnected, all interconnected, all interconnected. We're all interconnected. What does that mean to enterprise architecture? Enterprise architecture is about the structure, about how we put things together. What it means is enterprise architecture has got to address that. Billions of people being interconnected. It's going to be business and operating models transformed, completely different to what we've seen before. Yes, they've got governance. Yes, they've got technology. Yes, they've got process. Yes, they've got culture. But there's a lot more besides it. And the metrics and incentive programs are going to be quite out of this world. And then you've got the people with their digital skills. We're going to have to have digital leaders and investors. They need to know what to do. We need to help them. We need to give them structures that they can work with. We need to give them methods and capabilities. There are investors. There are pioneers. There are transformers. People who are leading us in all sorts of ways. So we've got to broaden the idea of the digital team, you know. Someone said to me a while back, oh, I see a great role for modelers. I see a great role for the digital team, the people in the business doing their own modeling, right? That's where we need to go. And we need to think as well about our future our future leaders who are only just coming into this world, or maybe coming in the future, who knows, right? We need to think about them because this is their world. And we have to build this world for them. That is our responsibility. And we are accountable for what has been delivered so far. And we are accountable for what will be delivered in the future. So we need to think those things through. So digital leadership means we've got to create HR capabilities, all sorts of different things that have to happen in our big world. Um, and just looking at that HR space, the transformations that are going on there are quite massive. So we've got changing digital HR functions and changing jobs and changing people and changing learning and changing process. Right? And we have to keep on top of it. And where are we in the open group? Well, we have a method called TOGA. And this actually, for those that uh, don't know it, is the core of the TOGA meta model. Right? This is a meta model. This is what enterprise architects work with and create. Do you know what? We're going to have an explosion of meta models. Already, lots of people have lots of meta models. These meta models have to work with each other. That means we have to get common terminology, common thinking, common ways of interconnecting these. That's what we have to find a way of doing. And of course, we also have to address other things that are coming. Digital policies, the citizen, governance, metrics, digital service, open data, AI. AI, pl AI platforms are not technology services. They feed directly into the business. That's what AI is about, isn't it? Learning, 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 learning. Feed it in, change, feed it in, change. We've got so many different changes going on. Poor old Marty, we've got to remember, is the person that we're trying to build these changes for. We must never forget Marty, because Marty means billions of people. What Marty wants are tools that will help him live in this world. He's got to have, if you look at him, he'll say to you, well, um, I'm a citizen, and I'm a citizen enterprise. That's what he is. And I am in the global world. And I'm sat in Indonesia, or I'm sat in Japan, or I'm sat in Argentina, 
and I want to work with all my compatriots all around the world in all the other countries. Right? But I'm a citizen enterprise. I build this, I grow this, I do this, and I want to have my trade with all these other people. So I want my infrastructure. I want to be agile. I want it virtual. I want to interoperate with anyone and anything at any time, whenever I want. And I'm going to use this little smart thing or something like it um, to do that. He's a consumer level tools user. We have to think about what the tools are that he needs. Um, and oh, by the way, he wants to do it himself. He, he doesn't have another person next to him that can do the modeling for him. Right? And when he does that model of what he wants to do, he wants to do what I call an automation click. There it is. He doesn't want to be spending months developing and doing C and agile methods and all of that stuff. He wants it there and then. So what he wants in his cupboard are a thousand applications. He can just go click, 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 and they all work. That's where we're going. That's what we need to do. That's what he wants. So we have to have economic tools for the citizen. And we have to live in the world of global enterprise architecture because that's where he is living as well. Now, the big infrastructure frameworks, the big companies, providing that global enterprise, and they're all in this room, right? Supporting the Amazons and the Ebays and the Ubers and the Deliveroo's and the Googles and the whatever. They're all operating a global enterprise. Lots of them. Lots of global enterprises. Right? Governments are seeing that and they're saying, mm, how, am I, how am I going to work with all of those different ones? How are they, they're doing work there in my country and they're doing work in that country and that country. How am I going to pull all of that together? I need to understand. That's what the World Economic Forum, G7, G8 as was, G20, United Nations are all trying to get the act together on. Because, you know, it's not just MRT, is it? There's billions of people out there. As, uh, every so often, I try and work out how many of there are, because you get some, uh, as uh, Mr. Trump will say, you know, false data going on, right? And the last time I saw it, there were 7 billion people. So let me ask a question, though. Anybody know the answer? How many of those 7 billion people are actually connected? I think if you had a billion of them, we'd be lucky at the moment. There's another 6 billion to come, plus those that are coming. That's a huge, huge infrastructure, right? So how are we going to deal with it? Oh, and by the way, we need to have the right governances in place to do that. And not only do we have billions of people, we've got billions and billions of creatures who are dependent on us getting this right. Because you know what? We've mucked their world up so far. We better clean it up and make sure that they've got a world to live in or else we won't have a world. So we have that responsibility of making sure digital transformation addresses all these, that the standards that are there are going to do that. And we have to do that through governance. Governance is absolutely critical because we have to take these countries with us. Whatever we decide to do in our forums this week, next year, next year or wherever, whatever we do, we've got to take the businesses and we've got to take governments with us. What we're doing needs to make a difference. And what we don't want are the dinosaurs, because the dinosaurs are dying out, OK? If you look along the UK high street, and I, I am sure this is going to be happening in lots of other high streets, it's dying. Transformation has completely changed it. When you start to look in 20 years' time on the roads, will you have the same sort of cars we've got now? Doubt it. Will you have the same transportation systems? Doubt it. We will have completely different capabilities as industrial societies. So our new frameworks, our capabilities in enterprise architecture, our capabilities that we're creating in all the forums need to recognize that we need to have global frameworks. 
and Marty too frameworks. So Marty can join in. So those seven billion people can be part of this world. We need lots of different architectures, industry architectures, citizen architectures, etc. Oh, and we also need ancient architectures. And somebody looks at me and they go, what do you mean by ancient? Well, I'm going to tell you a little story, right? And, and I'm, I've run out of time, but I don't care. So my little story is this. In the Thames, there are over 40 locks that manage the flow of water in the Thames. And when I was a young whippersnapper, and my husband was a young whippersnapper, he was a chemical engineering student, a PhD student at University College, just over the road from where I worked at Euston House, um, in uh, what was ICL now for Gypsy. And um, we were asked, well, the Thames have got a problem, and um, the water is asked, can we help them? But well, they want to work out how they can close the locks as you go down um, the Thames. And um, so I talked to Alan, who was my uh, partner at the time, but uh, became my husband, who became, by the way, Professor of Chemical Engineering at UCL. And we worked something out. So I did the programming, and he did the algorithms. And he was an expert in fluid mechanics, you see. So he went and visited all the lock keepers and the Thames people, and he worked out the fluid mechanics of how the Thames flows. And when the, when the um, pressure is at one lock, how long it takes for that pressure to get to the next one, and then the next one, and the next one. And he did his algorithms, and I did the algorithms, and I put them in a Fortran program, and we tested it, and it took us, I think, about eight weeks altogether to do this. And we put this program to the water industry, and we said, how about this? And they tested it out, and they put it in place, and it worked. That was before we had the Thames barrier, and it worked, and it still worked. And you know what? still works today. There was so much ancient stuff out there that's still working today. And you know what? The lock keepers won't let them get rid of it. Why? Because it works, and they like it, and it does what they want. So there is lots and lots of things that we've got out there that we have to think through. So our world is different. So what we have to think about with enterprise architecture and back to the future is we have to think about all these different transformational initiatives we need to put in place. What is it that we're doing in the Open Group? What are you guys doing? What are my mad professors doing out there in the forum? Are you ready for this challenge? of digital transformation? Are you up to dealing with the governments? Are you up to meeting the G20s? Right? Do we have something to say to them? I'm going to put that on your table. I'm going to ask you if during this week, when some of you are meeting, if you ask that question, what is it we're doing that's going to help our world of tomorrow? So I'd like to just say thank you very much for listening to me. You're a great audience. You didn't walk out and you didn't laugh at the wrong times. So I'm quite pleased about that. So thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Judith. Do, do have a seat. We are uh, uh, oh. out of time, but I do want to get... Uh, There's one cheeky question came in very early in your talk, which is... Of course. Um, what's really the uh, significance of G7 and G8 in digital transformation when they have some of the oldest populations in the world? Um, <clears throat> So I don't expect you to answer that, but uh, somebody was, uh, I think, making a, making a point that obviously, which is consistent with yours, but there are many other countries uh, that are uh, important and actually may be leapfrogging, to use your word, um, there are. on that. There are. So, but, but then they've got ancient um, people like me, right, and you, mm. and they have to deal with those. And we've got different problems than they had 100 years ago. And their population, uh, as our age is expanding and lengthening, they've got more people to deal with. Mm. So they have really big problems, right? So the big issue we have in the UK is care, right? How do you do care for the elderly? Because mm. we haven't got enough people to do that. Mm. Um, so this is where they're looking for AI to see if it can help 
you know, give care in the home. Yeah. Right. So yeah. there are lots of opportunities um, that, are, that are coming up that we've never had before. So I've um, only really got time for one question. Apologies for the people who submitted to them. Um, I think I know where this one comes from as well, but... Should enterprise, it is anonymous, but should enterprise architecture and TOGAF provide a data-driven focus area that up to this point in time seems to have lacked enough attention? We've sure. heard about data-driven, insight-driven, and the importance of data. Sure. Is that Any, something um, that, that oh. needs to be increased? Yeah, and, and I've been a great advocate for keeping data architecture. And um, I think we have the opportunity to do that. But I think we should do more. I think we should... Um, develop open data standards and uh, look at how we can architect open data because open data is something which the world will have and how do you do interoperability of open data um, and what sort of things do we need to do and how what's the structures that we need to put in place Ab absolutely critical all right Judith we have to leave it there for time but uh, you're very well thank you very much thank you thank you Judith Jones <laughs>